we're all receiving. If you can have faith to believe, you can receive in this time. All right, so, you know, they'll start rushing me through. So now I have to move into my next surprise guest. So I have another young, fresh face that I tapped and said, join me, join me and talk to me. So let me introduce you to my next interview. And that is, we call her T, but it's Tom Delel. <laughs> hey, T. Hey, Tiffany. <laughs> <laughs> See, they know we know each other because you're like, hey, Tiffany. <laughs> so how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Good, good, good. Okay, so you know I'm going to talk about legacy, but mm -hmm. I have to let the audience know T is actually on staff here. <laughs> I am. <laughs> so tell them a little bit about that. Well, um, I actually ended up here. You want me to tell them how I ended up here on staff? Well, or? What, tell them first what you do on staff. I'm the marketing manager. That doesn't really mean much because <laughs> I do more than that. Um, I do a lot of the branding and marketing, um, helping like the shirts, yes, and a lot of the other branding that you'll see. I have a great team that I work with. So You do. And mm -hmm. um, Tiffany happens to be my supervisor, manager, whatever you want to call her. <laughs> Champion. <No. laughs> All of that. So um, that's essentially what I do here at the Life Center. Mm -hmm. What else? Okay, well, tell us, how did you get here? Oh, my gosh. It's wild. I um, ended up doing some work for the Life Center for maybe four weeks. They contracted me for four weeks. It's a long story before that story, but I'll start there. Um, <laughs> it was really a blessing in disguise. I had no idea that I was going to get a phone call one day um, asking me if I could come help them with their online school, which was crazy because I actually needed, you know, some more income. So I... I did not expect it at all. Four weeks turned into two months. And I was like, Tiffany, um, my time is up. What, what are we doing here? She was like, just come back Monday. And I was like, oh my God, I don't have time for this. Like, I need to know what's really going on. But long story short, I contracted for about six months, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And then a position was offered to me. And I took the position because I really believe it was the Lord. And I don't think it was just to take a position because it was about income or it was about having a job or whatever. I really do believe it was like an assignment that God put me here to get some stuff into me. And Amen. yeah, yeah. Amen. So it was it's amazing. Um, I think I've grown a lot within the year that Tiffany has, <laughs> has been with me. <laughs> Look, let's not start telling stories in here because I can tell. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. No, no, no. no. no you're amazing to yeah. work with and you have this this ability. I'm like a fan. She says she's a fan. <laughs> I, I don't know I say that almost every day to her. I'm a fan because, I mean, your creativity is just it's awesome and it's so easy for you. And I, I have to tell this story. Oh, so I was talking to our, our producer of TLC Live, he's out of LA, so um, I was talking to him and I was like, well, because we've done these kind of shows before, and so I was like, we need a name for the show, da 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 da, and I gotta think of a name, okay, oh, I'll let you know when I think of a name. <laughs> and so I'm in there and I'm writing all these names down of what can we call the show, what can we call the show? And um, T walks in my office, <laughs> and I look up at T and I was like, I'm trying to think of a name for the live show. I mean, and, and 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 she looked at me and she said, What? And I said, I'm trying to think of a name and I can't think of a name. And I'm thinking of and I started naming some weird stuff. It was real awful. And then T goes, she looks at me and she goes, TLC Live. I go, Wow. <laughs> she really did. She went real extra that on me. It's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure. It it was just like she didn't even think about it. She didn't, she just, TLC Live. I mean, she said, Tiffany, it is the Life Center. I'm like, Makes yeah, sense. it is the Life Center. <laughs> so I, but, but that's simple, but I'm telling you, she is so creative. I mean, just simple things like our wonderful t-shirts and um, she's always branding and keeping us connected and keeping us together. And I just absolutely love working with you. I really do. You are inspiring me to be a little bit more creative. <laughs> I have some creativity inside of me somewhere. So tell us uh, about the legacy. Let's get back to Pastor Buddy right, and Dr. Right. Barry. You know, that's who this is <laughs> about. about. So tell me about the legacy. How has that impacted your life? You know, I think their, their yes 
really um, did a lot for me when I didn't even know them. They didn't know me, I didn't know them. I, pro I wasn't in the state of Georgia when they said yes. Mm -hmm. But because they did, it really, I guess God knew that I would be here and would need this type of place. Um, I needed some healing when I came here. And I mm. didn't know that I was gonna get the type of healing that I, that I needed. I didn't know that. But when I came here, I mean, they spoke directly to the, the issue, the, the issue of my soul hey. and what was going on. And because they said yes so many years ago, they positioned themselves for people like me. You know, been in church my whole life, pew baby, mm -hmm. you know, the whole quote unquote church hurt or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but Dr. Mary, and, and the funny thing you say, when I came into the church doors, literally, um, I came to see my um, brother, which is Pastor Samuel, and I had a situation. And I was like, I don't know what to do. She came with him just to pray for me. She didn't know me from nowhere. She heard about me, but she didn't I love know me. that about them. They are so personable. They are just they they're always there yes. and they care. Yes. They they really do care. Listen, Dr. Mary's like four something. I'm five eight. <laughs> almost five nine. So she hugged me and I felt like a little baby. Um, oh. I needed all the prayer that she gave me and that really positioned me to open myself back up and to receive. Um and so their legacy, it's their legacy is healing. It's I mean the prophetic we know, the apostolic yeah. oh, yeah. we know. Oh, yeah. But they, they actually care about the soul of a person and mm -hmm. the person. They do. You know, often mm -hmm. in church people just care about, you know, um, your gift, your gift or what you can and do. what you can do. That's right. And for her to take the time out to just hug me, mm -hmm. pray for me, and then here here's the thing. I didn't go here. She called my brother and said, How is your sister doing? It was like a week or so later. She kept asking about me, making sure that I was like, my heart was okay, making sure wow. that I was in a safe place. And that's what she kept saying. I just want to make sure she's safe. And this mm -hmm. was all had to do with being in the right place. And when I came here, the Lord, uh, when I finally joined, the Lord said to me that you will prosper. Uh, I will prosper you where I plant you. Wow. So Amen. their legacy, I mean, it's it's everything. Yes, to me. It's everything yes. as it relates to where I'm going now. Apostle Buddy, I mean, uh, <laughs> we have a lot of similarities and um, we're go getters. We're entrepreneurs and all of that. And his patience and his ability to see into somebody. Yes. That's amazing to me. Yeah, and, it is. And, and I mean, I'm so much younger than him, <laughs> but he doesn't let that get in the way. Yes. And so I really appreciate that. So you got the marketplace and you got the ministry side and I'm both. So, yes. you know, I'm, I, yeah. So they cover both aspects of me and that you can't really find. And God really put me in a position to receive that during mm -hmm. this time of my life. So, oh, yeah, that's what it really means. Yeah. I know. I love your story. I don't, I don't <laughs> it's even, crazy. <laughs> I'm sitting here like, I didn't know all of that. It's a lot. I can't so, even no, tell it but, so but much. That is so good I, of how you got here and how she reached out. And, yeah. You know, I just love that about them, that yeah. they care. Yeah. They, you know, that that just touches me. And one thing, um, you started to laugh about a possibility because we spend more time with him <laughs> yes. because he's in the office yes. and he oversees the office. And so we spend a lot of time with him. Yes. And he's so funny. Hilarious. He, he eats so everybody's funny. snacks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you leave your snacks in the on the <laughs> counter or in the refrigerator, he is going to eat your stuff. He's gonna he's gonna him. eat it and ask whose is it. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you and if you leave food in the refrigerator, I don't care if you have it tied up. He's going in it and he's gonna try it. He's gonna find out whose it is. He's gonna tell you how good it was. That's really him. I love that about him. And you know what they do? They start leaving things out so he just for just him. for him because like they know cake and cookies yes. and, and don't have any ice cream in the refrigerator. Oh my God, he will eat the ice cream. It's gone. It it'll be gone. But I love Seriously. that about him because yeah. as as focused and wise because yeah. he walks in wisdom in the office. Yes, he does. That he is, he's a whole lot of fun. And hilarious. And his sock game is His strong. sock game is stronger <laughs> than most people. Like these little millennials, they don't have anything on his sock game. <laughs> if you come to church, if you go outside right now, if you were here, if you were here in this building, you would see his socks. His sock game oh, is. Oh, his sock game is crazy. Is it's crazy. And, and it's so funny because talking about millennials um you guys photo shoots <laughs> lord you guys in uh, 
getting him to wear those bow ties. He looked he looked amazing. <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. He looked so good in the bow tie. Well, he 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 went along with that. He did. But he drew the line at skinny jeans. He did draw the line at the skinny jeans. He said, "I'm not about to be wearing no skinny jeans. I'm just not." One day we tried to get him in some um some jeans with some holes in it. And he was like, "I'm not going to be looking like I'm on poverty." <laughs> We were like, on poverty? Apostle Buddy, you can't be on poverty. But that's exactly what he said. He said, I'm not going to be looking like I'm on poverty. <laughs> but we cracked up so hard, so hard Oh, I love that yeah. about him. Well, let's, let's do this. Why don't you share a message from your heart to Dr. Mary and Apostle Buddy? Oh, my God. Dr. Mary, Apostle Buddy, I love you guys so much. Um, you've been patient. You've been kind. Your hugs are you know, what I needed at times, Apostle Buddy, you know, we're, we're becoming um, more and more, um, like, we're just becoming closer, and I really appreciate the opportunities that you've given me. Um, just naturally, so many people have paid attention to my spiritual abilities, and didn't really look into, you know, the marketplace side of me. You're taking the time to do it. You both of you guys are investing in me, and I appreciate it, and I wish you all the best. Um, I'm excited to be a part of your legacy. I love you all, and I can't wait to keep going with you. That, that's it. Now see, you're gonna make me cry. You you're not gonna I'm cry, cry baby. Tiffany, cut it out. Come on. Cut it out. You know I'm a cry baby. <laughs> she is, and it's not good. <laughs> that, was, that was so touching, because let me just say this. Honestly, I have watched you grow in this time, and, um, Cause that was sometimes I want to throw something at you and then repent. No, I'm just kidding. But she threw her mouth at me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I have, and and I'm thankful that God chose me and allowed me to see it, to to watch it, and I'm proud of you. I really am. I'm I'm thankful for you, and I'm thankful that I get to be a part of who you are becoming, and you are becoming an amazing woman of God, wow. and I just. I'm in awe of God and what he's doing in your life. Wow. So God bless you, and thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Tiffany. All right, guys. Well, we are, um, we are now going to uh, talk a little bit about what has been going on this week. And you know what? what uh, if it's okay, you, you want to stay in? in Sh sure. Okay, because <laughs> you know you're a talker, so just hang in there. Woo! So let's well let's talk about who we had this week. So we kicked off the week. Hank Kuhneman. Let me tell you. Hank Kuhneman. Man of God, man of God, man of God. He was walking, huh? Yes, he was walking. Yeah, he was walking. Awesome word. And then he came back on morning. Wednesday morning. Uh huh. And yes. he was amazing. That word was awesome as well. Yes. The anointing was flowing. And then we had uh, Chuck Pierce. Wait, wait, wait. Our very own. Oh. Prophet. Prophet yeah, Catherine, Catherine Sykes, yes, that's oh, right. Prophet let Catherine. me tell you, let me tell you. She did you. the uh, afternoon session. She sure yes. did. Uh huh. Yes. She did the afternoon uh, they session. They told me that the activations were amazing. I know, yeah, I know. They and, said it was different. And healing actually took place in the room while they were activating. Oh, wow. Yes, yeah, yes. I was next that was the power of God. Of course. So. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, let's not. <laughs> um, but that was amazing that healing broke out yeah. during activations. Yeah. Um, and then... Uh, evening session. Chuck Pierce. Oh my God, man of God, man Chuck of God. Pierce. You know, you know, Chuck Pierce always wears these really cool, different shirts. I know. Yeah, it's it's hilarious. To me, it's hilarious because you just wouldn't picture him doing that. He walks around with his beard and like the the like I'm on vacation shirts. <laughs> <I know. laughs> and that's just him. That's just him. I know. I know. But when he starts to speak, it's so much huh? I know so much power different. and authority comes out of his mouth. It's like, oh my God. And that's probably why he's like, I'm comfortable being me. I yes, know who I yes. Am. I'm sure that is. Yeah. I'm sure that is. And then, wait, 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 wait. So we went from there to, he came back the next morning, he came Chuck back that Pierce. Morning. They said his morning session kind of put a cap on what he talked about that, that night. night. Yeah, Amen. just really showing or, or d displaying how to go through transition and leave a legacy. Amen. So Amen. Amazing. Well, listen, guys, we've talked enough, <laughs> and it's time to go back in Woo! because it is time for the word Woo! of God from the man of God. Yes. I'm telling you, we're excited about him being here because the energy <laughs> is going to be crazy. So when I leave you, I'm going in the atmosphere while you're watching it. So we're going to go back live, and then don't forget, come back now. 
We will see you after service. We're going to have special guests, and I'm trying to get Dr. Stevenson back here for an interview and answer some of your questions. So we'll see you after service. Let's go back into the sanctuary. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Well, if you would just turn your attention to the screens, we're going to watch the evening's announcements uh, be just for a few minutes. Thank you. Do you have a nonprofit organization or a business? Are you finding it difficult to receive funding to finance your community project or business venture? Worry no more, my friend. The Marketplace Alliance Group is proud to present the Grant Writing and Government Contract Seminar, Saturday, October 7th, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Life Center's Social Hall. Our presenters are Dr. Don White, with experience in writing and receiving grants to fund educational and community projects. Miss Mary Elise Murray, with experience in writing government and operational grants. And Miss Deborah Barrett, a distinguished member of the Government Contractors Association. These three powerful women will give you valuable information about key components of grant proposal, techniques in researching potential funders, strategies for obtaining government contracts in Georgia, and a whole lot more. Your cost for this in-depth seminar is only $49. That's right, $49. But after September 17th, the price goes up to $99. For more information, go to the foyer after service and register at marketplacealliancegroup.com. Hallelujah. Well, it is my honor again tonight to introduce this evening's speaker. How many of you are familiar with Apostle Matthew Stevenson? Well, it doesn't sound like he needs much of an introduction, so I will not belabor it. But for those of you who are not familiar with him, he is a, uh, an apostolic prophet, the senior leader and founder of All Nations Worship Assembly based in Chicago with extension churches uh, in a number of places. He has a, uh, been in ministry for 16 years and oversees as the 
the Apostolic Oversight, the GATE Network, which has uh, ministries throughout the world that he provides apostolic uh, insight, revelation, and supervision over. He is a governmental prophet with a now word for this generation, an up-and-coming general into this generation. He's a provocative preacher. He has revelation from heaven. He is able to uh, move and flow in Holy Spirit gifts in such a way that, that shakes foundations and begins to shift atmospheres. So we are so excited. We love him. Uh, he and his wonderful wife, Apostle Camila. <laughs> She is such a gift, and we love both of them. Uh, they're connected to this house and part of our extended family. And so would you please give a warm Atlanta welcome to Apostle Matthew Stevenson. Hallelujah. Well, can we give Jesus a hand praise all over this building? Hallelujah. Listen, we have a couple of things to do, uh, but before we get to business, I would like to give one more thunderous ovation for Drs. Buddy and Mary Crumb. Can we do that? We love them. All right. Now you can be seated for about 20 seconds, and then we'll see what happens. Um, I absolutely agree. Uh, that I am a part of, uh, and I've been a recipient of the impartation of the reproduction anointing. Uh, when we met, we were already prophesying and all of that stuff. I just didn't believe in teaching other people how to do it. And, um, <laughs> and so I did it and laid hands on people and hoped they would do it. And um, it worked for a while. But once we met, we all decided that it was beneficial to have more than one of me. So undoubtedly, I am also a recipient of that anointing, and I proudly uh, declare all over all nations that we are reproducers that reproduce, reproducers that we produce. So thank you for that. I want to acknowledge um, Pastor LeBron Friend, who's here from All Nations Worship Assembly Atlanta. Um, so God has been so good to us, and... Um, I was telling uh, Apostle Buddy that every time I come, I have to give you a new hairstyle. So <laughs> last time I was here, I had long hair, and now I got short hair. Next year, I may do the Montel Williams. It just des depends on my mood. I have a word from the Lord, and we're going to get into that. But um, we have a white elephant in the room. We are a prophetic people, aren't we? And the white elephant in the room, her name is Irma. Its name is Irma. I want to deal with this really quickly. Um, I've been sitting there, bubbling, trying not to bind her in the middle of the play, but I just want to deal with her. We believe that resident within who and what we are, we have the ability to turn and reverse things in creation. And we are the sons of God, and so I believe that if Jesus stood and spoke to winds, the Bible says he rebuked them meaning there was something demonic behind them. Rather than seeing these as confirmations of the end times, I think we should speak to them and rebuke them so that the kingdom of God can be established. Who agrees with that? Now, can we, after this we're going to teach, but can we just act like wild charismatics for about 10 seconds and just throw your hands up and begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, will you? Come on, as loud as you can. Let's begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Let's pray in the Holy Ghost. Sibia, 
Matthew chapter 13, and I'm reading in the New King James Version, but it may sound very similar in all of the versions you may be reading from. I saw a strange thing last week at my church, and it was a physical Bible. You know, <laughs> when you lead a church full of millennials and, and baby boomers who are around millennials, when you say, open your Bible, they do like this. And How many of you are blessed enough to have an iPhone? Let me see how many of you are anointed of God. Amen. 
How many of you have one of those other things? Praise him. <laughs> Join me at Matthew chapter 13, and I want to start at verse 24. And we're going to use verses 24 through 30. And the louder you say amen, the quicker I will be. In verse 24, the scriptures say, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept. Can we say that phrase together? But while men slept. His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barns in Jesus' name. Father, help me to preach this. Amen. I'm going to talk to you tonight from the topic, while we were sleeping. While we were sleeping. Uh, if you are uh, building anything or constructing anything, and that's a part of what we do, whether it is a wineskin or a tapestry for family or business, all of us that are engaged in or actively engaged in constructing or advancing something in the kingdom, this is going to be a very profound word for you, particularly for the remainder of this season. We have been in a very aggressive tug of war and a very aggressive competition of strengths and uh, it has not been defeat it's just been a, a strong strong tug of war how many of you have ever played the rope game tug of war where there's a, a constant pulling back and forth until one team finally quits that's what it feels like doesn't it it feels like an aggressive tug of war and uh, actually for the last several decades the, the kingdom has made very substantial advances we are starting to open up to bigger discussions we're starting to consider and we're starting a dialogue about things that have been tabled or delayed we're having relevant conversation we're starting to address things like racism we're starting to address things like human fairness and equality we're starting to address political corruption we're starting to address systemic poverty and what I love about these discussions is we are not using religious lingo to do it I, I believe that there is a candor of God that has hit the earth and we are talking very blatantly about the affairs of our world these are advancements these are advancements in the same way Way, there has been an intense, I mean almost feverish, a vehement increase from the assaults in the belt from the belly of hell. It has seemed almost as if there has been a freshness, almost like a, a level of wickedness and a degree of evil that has been new. It, it, and, and, and you know, we know the scripture said that there's nothing new under the sun, but there is a definite deliberateness almost like an intentionality where in this type of battle there had been no rules I mean in my city where I'm from the young people are targets uh, you know in the Bible when they would have gory battles a part of what they would do the Philistines would walk up to Israeli women and split their be bellies open and eat their children it's been gory it's been bloody it has been a level of war and I believe the level of war that we have been in has been so perplexing that it is almost 
produced a state. It, it, it's battle shock. It is a, a, a sense of stagnation and almost paralysis that we must address by the Spirit. And this particular scripture it has several points of tension and several revelations that I think is going to help you for this season. First of all, let me say this. For those of you that teach and preach the Word of God, my wife is a dynamic teacher. I believe that we're going to see a different edge. Many of you who are apostolic or prophetic, there is a teaching spirit that is being born in the earth right now because ignorance is at an all-time high. And it doesn't mean that there is an absence of information. There is an absence of comprehension. One of the things that comes with religion is an ignorant spirit. You can see it on social media, and it almost seems like the people who know the least talk the most. <laughs> we need a teaching anointing, an anointing of discipline. The Bible talks about how discipline is on the back of sons, and we need that teaching anointing. I want to share with you that there is a need right now to open the parables of Jesus. And one of the reasons this is so is because we are struggling to understand what the kingdom actually is. You know, in this day, if we buy a few buildings or if we start a few enterprises, and I believe in all of that, that we automatically think that because we have bought things or started things that we are doing the work of the kingdom. So a lot of what we call kingdom is actually just innovative or actually just entrepreneurial. And how many of you know if you are in the kingdom, you will do that. But it is possible to do all of that and still not be driven by the power of the kingdom of God. There are churches around the world who start record groups or have a, a homeless shelters and they do things aside from the local church. And then they start using the language or the terms of the kingdom. But how many of you know if there is no confrontational agenda behind your company or or behind your outreach, or behind your real estate, then what you have done is you have created something to amass riches for yourself, but it is not the kingdom. Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the finger of God, then, say then, come on, say then, then the kingdom of God has done what? Has come to you. So what that means is that starting something, a company, a family, a business, a real estate program, an outreach thing is only beneficial when it is driven by kingdom power. And everything that is done by kingdom power will actively, I mean progressively, confront the powers of hell. Heretofore, we have had a very passive approach. Even unfortunately, apostolic and prophetic people, we are very reactive. We only hear from the prophets once the stuff is manifested. So now what we're dealing with is the storm prophets, aren't we? Or I saw that, or I felt that in my spirit, or I was getting that in prayer. Well, ma'am, that's fine now, but we can't do anything with your retroactive revelation. What we needed was somebody to stand up when nothing was happening to say, hey, I have a word from the Lord. Your aftermath predictions ain't helping nobody. There is, and I want to address it tonight, a, 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 an apathy, a spirit of passive aggressiveness, where the way we deal with what's going on in the spirit is by volume and microphones and harsh tongues. But God is looking for people that will be energized to act. That is what intercession is. So when we try to decipher and discern what the kingdom is, the way Jesus taught the kingdom was in parabolic fashion. He understood that because we are citizens of the earth, there were certain things about the culture of heaven that we would never understand unless he told it in story form. What a parable is, is an earthly contrast or an or earthly comparison to a higher reality uh, uh, that is translated through an earthly reality. So he would always say the kingdom of heaven is likened unto or the kingdom of God is likened unto. Whenever he would stand up and preach and teach and bring men into understanding about the kingdom he would use a parable and here's why. He knew that for the rest of Christianity people would be trying to understand the kingdom in 
the flesh. They would be trying to understand the kingdom by their culture. This is why people really do believe that Jesus Christ is the mascot of their personal backgrounds. The evangelical thinks he belongs to them. The Democrats thinks he belongs to them. The Republicans think he belongs to them. And how many of you know Jesus Christ is not black? I'm going to get in trouble tonight. He's not white. He's not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. He didn't vote for Hillary. He ain't vote for Trump. Jesus Christ is none of that. He does not have a side. He is the king. Come on, either you say amen or I'm going to crack in here. He is the king. The only side he is on is his own. When people, I feel like preaching now, try to understand the kingdom through the flesh, they do what Jesus warned about, which was try to understand the kingdom by observation. And Jesus said, the kingdom of God does not come by observation. You can't look around at some statistics and some numbers and some facts and think that that's how the kingdom comes. And then Paul said, the kingdom of God is not me. It's not what is he saying? It ain't fleshly. It's not external. It's not something you can observe. But it is righteousness. It's joy. And it's peace. And it comes in the Holy Ghost. So the parables reveal the mystery of the kingdom. It unfolds the mystery of the kingdom. Why? For objectivity. Because if you're going to be kingdom, you must be objective. you got to have God's principles as what motivates you. You are only on the Lord's side. And for those of you that don't know, the man does have a side. Moses preached a whole message saying, which of you is on the Lord's side? Now listen, if your loyalty to your denomination, to your ethnicity, to your political party, to your background is more preferential than your loyalty, to the Lord's side then what's happening is you are actually a part of the problem oh come on let's bust a devil upside the head in here so we need parables to take the kingdom out of the hands of mishandlers people that preach the kingdom from their own prejudice or people that preach the kingdom from their own or people that preach the kingdom from their own prerogatives. The kingdom of God must be handled righteously. How do you do that? You teach in parables. You unlock what Jesus said. And so in this parable, he gives us a very profound principle. And the Spirit of God whispered this to me last week. Some, the wheat and the tear are growing together. Oh, the wheat and the tear are growing together. The wheat and the tare are growing together. It opens up by saying the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sows seed, which means that there are phases and there are cycles of development in the kingdom. Nothing in the kingdom arrives as it's going to be. God is a God of stewardship, which means that he will give you a promise in seed form and watch you watch it. And then he'll watch you water it occur accordingly. Now, many of you could have gotten blessed right there because you're expecting your miracle and your abundance to come as a finished product. Well, that would make God a negligent parent because he would be blessing you while you're irresponsible. When he wanted to send the human race Jesus, he didn't send him as a full-blown man. He sent him as an infant. Why? He wanted to watch the human race, watch the Messiah so that when he got on Calvary, it would make sense. God is after our stewardship. Say amen. amen. So the kingdom operates on seed time and harvest. We, we, we must be very careful about violating the law of seeds. Many of us disrespect the cycle of blessing because we dishonor what power we have when we have seed. You see, that is God's problem with the homosexual agenda. It is not that he don't like homosexuals. He loves them. Jesus died for them. His problem with it is the abuse of seed. If, if the seed of a man is the most powerful thing that he gave the human race, then he can't watch it as it's mixed with fecal. 
It's seed God is worried about. That's his problem with all of it. He sent his son in seed form. He sent his word in seed form. He gives us resources. Everything that happens, happens in what? In seed form. So those of you that feel like all you have is a seed, that feel like, oh, listen, if it doesn't meet your need, it must be a seed. That's why if you have just a little, then you are the ones who qualify for a lot. You qualify for God to meet your, your biggest needs miraculously if you treat your seed the right way. Say, I hear you. He says he sowed seed in the field, verse 25, but something happened. Men fell asleep. Often when we are given seed, sometimes in our subconscious uh, 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 contentment, we go into a comatose state. We are relaxed. We go at ease. We, we, we develop the tendency to sleep. And uh, what I know about this season as an Issachar voice, the church is very much alive. The devil can't kill us. You know, the Bible says uh, that the gates of hell will not prevail. But how many of you go to sleep every night? Wave your hand if you go to sleep every night. If you don't, there's deliverance ministry available somewhere around here. I'm certain of it. How many of you go to sleep? Now, when you sleep, do you die? No, you're very much alive. The church is alive. She sleep. She's taking a century-long nap. Hmm. While men had seeds, they fell asleep. I believe that something happened in Genesis chapter 2. My diligent students of the word should go and research this. I was looking, and the Bible says that when God put Adam to sleep, he took a rib and made a woman. The next verse literally says this. And when man saw the woman, he said, this is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. But you know what's missing? I never saw when Adam woke up. A sleep came upon him. And the next thing we saw was that he saw a woman. But we do not see when he woke up. <laughs> You know what I believe? I believe that the human race had been in a powerful slumber until Jesus Christ. This is why Adam willingly transferred his authority to the serpent because he was sleepwalking. The Adam nature is a sleepy nature. The sin nature is a comatose nature. When you are in sin, talking to your adversary, in conversation with the snake, disobeying God, opening yourself up to the occult, you're not doing that in an awakened form. You're doing that in a sleepy state. Therefore, anything that lives their life under the Adam, the first Adam, lives their life sleep. And when you are asleep, there is a phase in your sleep where you go into paralysis. You are aware of what's happening. You may be a light sleeper and, and sensitive to light or sensitive to dark, but there is a thing called sleep paralysis where in order to rest sufficiently, your body and your muscles don't move as quickly. They are not reactive. They are not responsive. They don't do anything. How many of you have ever slept walk before? You have a kid that sleep walk. When my daughter, my eldest daughter was young, she would sleep walk. She would wake up and have whole conversations. She would walk into walls and so I would have to get up and tell her, hey, 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 this is not real. I believe that one of the reasons why we are not as aggressive as we should be is because we are mistaking our activity for progress. Just because there's a lot of moving and a lot of preaching and a lot of TV and a lot of stuff does not mean we're going forward. We could be sleepwalking. How do you know that? Well, the parable is clear. That when men sleeps, the enemy comes. 
It says, while we slept, the enemy came, and he sold things. Here's what you've got to know. Even the forces of darkness obeyed the principle of seed. Uh, he still is regulated by the law of sowing and reaping. He does not get to operate outside of that law. Every major soul tie that started in your life began as a seed. It was a conversation because it was, before it was a relationship. If you think about addiction, if you get exposed to, to pornography or you get exposed to alcoholism, that stuff does not just start as a full-blown desire. It starts as a seed. When you start to be confused about who you're going to be or what your gender is or what you're going to believe, that stuff does not happen overnight. What happens is the devil strategically waits until our heart is ripe and unguarded and unmanned and he sows seed. In school he sows seed. Through friends he sows seed. Through nightmares he sows seed. He is a seed sower. Now some of you don't even realize it but right now wrong seed is being planted in you. All seed is not good seed. Oh, praise the wonderful name of Jesus. How many of you know dishonor is a seed? When you are somebody that can't submit to authority, refuses to realize that in the kingdom there is rank. Oh, it's quiet now. And there is order. And there is a such thing as authority. That stuff starts with a seed. If you don't believe me, ask Lucifer. He didn't fall from heaven after a meeting with his team. He fell from heaven because of a mismanaged moment where a seed sprung up in his heart. I will ascend to the most high seed. I will become like God's seed. I will make the world my throne. What happened? And he acted on the manifestation of a seed. That seed was watered by his own ambition, and then he recruited other people with it, and there was a fall. All started with a seed. A seed can manifest in a mismanaged moment. A seed can manifest in a thought. You can have a fleeting thought that you don't deal with and it can become a seed. But the principle is wherever there is seed, there will be fruit. Your life is a byproduct of the seeds that have been sown, either good or bad. Your marriage is a reflection of what you have sown into it. Even if you don't sow into it, you're sowing into it. Negligence is a seed. So silence is a seed when you are married and you don't have sex with your spouse that is a seed of rejection so there's a whole lot of stuff that we are sowing by the devil's inspiration that we don't realize is being sown and when the harvest comes while we were asleep Satan was sowing he was walking looking for the vulnerable areas it's a dangerous thing to be in when the watchmen are asleep. It's a dangerous spot to be in when the worshipers are asleep. It's a dangerous place to be in when fathers fall asleep. It's a dangerous thing to be in a city where the church has fallen asleep. How do we know the church is asleep? Because we are suffering from the sin of silence. The only people bringing truth to kingdom issues are activists that don't have the Holy Ghost. And yet those of us who name the name of Jesus and are filled with the Spirit of God are muzzled in moments where we have opportunity to create history. It is a seed. Sleeping is a form of being relaxed. Now, one of the reasons why we know that this is what's going on in the Spirit is because a lot of the voices that God is raising up are alarms. Sound the alarm. What he told Joel, sound, make the alarm go off. People that are awake don't need alarms. A church that wants covers so they can get comfortable is not woke. When God wants to wake up a people, he raises up voices, watch me, that annoy them, that agitate them, that shake them up a bit. You see, this is not the season where we make people comfortable. This is not the season where we try to stabilize the boat. I believe there is a shaking going on in the spirit, and God is raising up alarming worship, alarming prayer, alarming teachers, alarming prophets, alarming preachers. Somebody say, sound the alarm. Come on, open your mouth. Say, sound the alarm. Sound the alarm. Oh, God. 
Whenever in the scriptures where you see God talking about an alarm, he's talking to a people that have fallen asleep. The Bible says the enemy came and he sowed tares among the wheat and then he went his way. Look at verse 26. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares appeared. Here is why this is important for you. It's because your crop is not harvest. <laughs> in biblical times, they would refer to crops and harvest differently. Crops were the first appearance or the first sign of growth, and harvest was full-grown growth. The crop was the first appearance. And you know what fascinates me? Wikipedia says when things first begin to sprout, as far as wheat is concerned, there is no ability to distinguish wheat from tear. They both look alike. There is no distinction. There is no discernment. There is no ability to, to decipher. No clarity operates when things first appear. This is why we must always walk in humility before God because the first sign of growth is not a victory. Just because you've been able to stop something soon or you've been able to get something quick does not mean that you have walked in victory. It means that you have done the initial work to get the ground plowed up and the stuff to start growing and one of the reasons why there is sabotage and there is sneak attack is because we rejoice too soon if you must manage victories well you can't just stop because things start to grow you've got to wait until there is a harvest and the Bible says that the tear appeared with the wheat verse 27 so the owners came to him and said, didn't you sow good seed? How then does it have tares? But he said to them, an enemy has done this. In every company, in every family, in every church, in every vision, there are going to be, now here is my principle, you need to understand this. There are going to be identical twins that pop up. If you get this, it will really bless you. There will be identical twins. The twins that pop up if you are decided to build something for God in your purpose, you must realize this principle. That in every level of advancement, there is an identical attack. The attack grows at the level of your advancement. Which means that an intensified attack, Lord have mercy, a next level attack, next level adversity does not mean that you've missed God, that you are without God, or that you are outside of God's grace. Not all the time. The next level attack means that there has been next level advancement. All attack prophesies and prognosticates that there so an attack must be strengthened. Now, there's about 12 people in here that have been under aggressive attack. And you don't even understand why it, it's been so aggressive. It's almost like, okay, first it was my husband. Now it's my husband and my body. Then it was my husband and my body. Now it's my husband, my body, and my son. Then it was my husband, my body, and my son. Now it's my husband, my body, my son, my job. Then it was my husband, my body, my son, my job. Listen, there is something I've got to teach you about advancement. It is possible to grow and not notice it. Come on, turn me up on the mic. I want the devil to hear this. I said it is possible to have left a level and not realize it, particularly those of you that have only been interested in just obeying God. You've not been looking for the applause of people. You didn't want to get ordained. You weren't trying to get preferred treatment. You weren't trying to be buddy buddies with people at the top. I was just serving and I didn't care if I was seen. I was just serving and I didn't care if I was rewarded. I was just serving and didn't care about who paid me. See, when you occupy yourself and being unwavering in your faithfulness to God, you grow, you expand, you stretch out, but you may be the last one to notice it. 
Let me prophesy to you. Satan has noticed that you are no longer who you used to be. Well, I feel my preach now. I said Satan has become aware that you have left an old version of you. You have left an old dimension. You have left an old realm. So there is no such thing as progress without problems. There is no such thing as advancement without attack. In your progress, you must expect stronger problems. But here is wisdom. Are you ready for this? What Satan wants from you is for you to be distracted by the tear. Oh, this feels real good. Oh, don't sit there and act like you're not susceptible to this. I know you got your pressure on and you've been facing the ease for the last month, but there are those of us that are human beings that don't realize we are advancing because of what the attack hits. And when the devil comes to attack, he's not going to touch an area that's not sensitive. He's going to touch the things closest to you because his objective is to make you stop. His objective is to make you when there has been growth. The wheat and the tear go together. You will notice that in comatose states, you think things are other things. Now, the presence of an attack, oh glory, or the presence of backlash, or the presence of problems often draw our attention away from cultivating the wheat, from, from, from watering what's right. From, from strengthening that that remains. Sometimes, particularly if we get relaxed in our emotional selves, it seems like the tear will call our whole name. We will put our money on the tear. We will put our attention to the tear. We'll start trying to avoid the tear. It'll start robbing us of energy. But just like the tear is growing, something is growing in the midst of the tear. And if you allow yourself to become distracted, it because tears are growing with wheat, then you will miss your harvest. It matters what you pay attention to. Hmm. It matters what you allow yourself to study. It matters what you allow yourself to cultivate. He said an enemy has done this. Now listen. You need to become well-versed, I'm almost done, at the activity of your enemy. But one of the reasons why you're losing is because you don't know your opponent well enough. You, you, you've got a good luck version of Christianity. See no evil, speak the devil as a boogeyman, don't mention his name. But the problem with that is, no champion wins by ignoring his adversary. The Bible says don't be ignorant. Come on, I want just two people. Do not be ignorant of Satan's devices. It's the same ignorance that's got us blaming murder on God. I hate that. In my city when teenagers die or when there's been an abusive cop religious men stand behind pulpits and say God works in my 
mysterious ways. This is the will of God. Just accept what God allowed. What we need is somebody to stand up and say, hey guys, God didn't do this. A demon did this. And if we allow, come on church, if we don't wake up and allow ourselves to be awakened, the devil is going to keep going unrecognized. An enemy has done this. An enemy has done this. You must become well versed at what the intent of hell is toward what you're building. You must know the promise of God. That is your anchor. But you are going to be ill prepared if you don't realize that every prophecy has an opponent. What they should have taught us in the prophetic movement was prophecy management because what's happened is when the prophet comes to town and issues the mind of God as a passive recipient we say yes Lord do it and go home and go to sleep two years later when the prophecy ain't came to pass now we're wounded barely paying our tithes go to an Anglican church because we mad at the prophetic movement when we were not aggressive recipient. Paul told Timothy, I want you to wage a good walk. Who am I talking to? According to the prophecies that have gone on before you. Many of you need to repent. Them prophecies are on tapes and they're not doing nothing on them tapes. You don't treat them differently from poetry. You're sitting up listening to them, oh, that sure bless me. Oh, that sure a lot of confirmation. Oh, that sure edification. Oh, it was meant to be much more than that. That prophetic word is a battering ram of God. It is a sword of the spirit. It is like a light in a dark places. If you don't use your word well, you are weaponless in war. An enemy has done this. How many of you are afraid of snakes? Where you? Hey, I feel the anointing coming in. If you, if you lead anything in the kingdom, you've got to be well versed at handling animal natures. Paul said, "When I was with Ephesus, I wrestled with beasts. Jesus was tempted in the presence of beasts." He told the apostles, I've given you authority authority over serpents and scorpions. He told the, his disciples, don't you give pearls to swine. He, call, he, he, he called Herod a fox. So there are animal natures. I don't have time to teach you that, but I believe that one of the problems with us is we don't know how to be zookeepers. When you plant churches and raise businesses, there will be people who manifest the traits of animals. And if you don't know what it is to quarantine them, to cage them, and to stop them from killing each other, you will be bit to death and quit. I used to be scared of snakes too. I would watch them. Oh my God, that's a cobra. Oh my God. Oh, python. Oh, it, you know. But one day the spirit of God spoke to me. I'm going to finish preaching, but I want to bless you. He said, son, that's a snake. I said, I know. My God. He said, son, she's a snake. I said, my God, the blood of Jesus. Let me do what do you want me to do? Nothing. I said, why? He said, because you know it's a snake. See, here's the power of recognition. If you know a snake is a snake, then you're safe. You don't have to run from it. You already know what you're dealing with. And some of you think you're under attack and you're not. God just allowed you to see a thing for what it is. When you see something for what it is, then you know what your next move is supposed to be. I'm walking in here. I'm not afraid of snakes because I know where they're at. You don't have to run. You don't have to be afraid. You look at it and say, oh yeah, that's a snake. And you determine your next action. Why? Satan is afraid of your ability to detect things. Glory to the Son of God. An enemy has done this. And some of you have been blaming things on your family members. You've been blaming things on God. Well, if God is God, why did he cheat on me? But I believe God is sharpening your ability to discern in this hour. And I'm not talking about making you paranoid. And I'm not talking about making you a schizophrenic delusion. I'm talking about discernment by the Spirit of God. Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God is sharp. It is quick. It deserves the joy. 
joint from the marrow, the soul from the spirit. But he shows us is that one of the ways the kingdom operates is by accurate discernment. That everything saying Jesus does not belong to him. How I many of you know we got some anointed wizards in the body of Christ? We need discernment in this hour. We, how many of you know that there are a lot of monsters in our pulpits? There's a lot of people redirecting the attention from heaven to put it on their personal brand. We need discernment. How I many of you know the kingdom is not your brand? The kingdom is not your trademark. The kingdom is not your copyright. We must have discernment. An enemy has done this. It takes for an awakened person to recognize what the enemy has done. It says the enemy has done this. And now look at the response. Do you want us to go and gather the tares? Oh, I love this. Do you, do you want us to go and address them? Should we stop growing? Should we halt everything around us to make sure that we spend time? You know what I hate? I'm a deliverance guy. You know, I believe in casting the devil out. There's nothing that brings me more joy than to grab the head, especially out of you Christians, than to grab the head <laughs> of Christians and cast the devil out. And I love real deliverance. You know, there are Christians who come to the altar like, I need help with hurt. I'm like, yeah, but there's a little Jezebel in there too. Let me help you with the bigger devils, okay? Um, <laughs> I love casting the devil out. But you know what aggravates me? When people go to prayer to talk to Satan. So, so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we bind uh, you devil. Uh, hear me? It's like, uh, you got God holding the phone for you to talk to his adversary. You, you have given the forces of hell the privilege of your conversation, and you have abandoned your authority by not using the principles God gave you. How many of you know to go to prayer to talk to the devil is unnecessary? You are in your secret place talking about the witch of the west, the queen of heaven, the strange spirit of the east, the Illuminati. How religious is that? I believe if you're going to use your authority, you got to go up higher in your warfare, and you got to go up higher in your language, higher in your strategy, and you fight the devil with the word of God. What do you want us to do? Do we stop and go and deal with the tear? I love the wisdom of this because he says, no, let it grow with the wheat. Let the problems grow with the progress. Let the attack go with the advancement. Let, 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 let the crisis grow with the anointing. How many of you know you don't need an anointing if you're not called to crisis? Your problem is you want to preach in a comfortable scenario. But there are some of us in here that were born for 911 moments. There are people who are mantled for crisis. There are people who have been held back until the world was bad enough so that y'all could appreciate a real word. Let it grow with it. Meaning when you get under attack, you don't have to immediately turn and address it. What you need to do is use it as affirmation that something must be growing around here. Oh, I feel if something hits your house, I would turn from the attack and say, I wonder what's advanced that I don't know. If something starts shaking, look around and say, I wonder what's moving that I hadn't paid attention to. Use the adversity to indicate the advancement. If you don't believe me, Look at the areas in your life that are under attack right now. Ay, 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 ay. Look at the areas in your church that are under attack right now. Look at your children. Whatever is under attack is what hell is most afraid of. Something has gone out in the spirit and the devil is aware of it. So what he's trying to do is distract you. Uh-uh. Don't look over here. No, don't see this. If you can look beyond the attack, if you can look beyond the problem and look beyond the backlash, you're going to find that there is a move of God that has hit your life that you are unaware of. There is a move of God that has hit your family that you are unaware of. There is a move of God that's growing in your church that you don't know it. Don't miss it. Why? The devil is an attention whore. He loves worship. 
He wants you to look to him and give him all of your attention. Why are you sitting up crying over this? Why are you leaving the church over offense? I hear the Spirit of God saying to many of you, grow up. Paul said, when I was a child, y'all don't like that. I spoke as a child, but when I became a man, I put away child and said, who cares if you didn't sing the solo? Who cares if you didn't sit up front? Who cares if you didn't make the team grow your tail? <laughs> grow up. Because what's happening is the devil is trying to deflect so that you don't realize that he's been like an umpire to stand as a guard over something God has already started to do. God said, let them grow together because in order to appreciate the wheat, you've got to allow the tear to grow. In a congregation, there will be people that are sent there on assignment by hell. <laughs> oh yeah, I know you want me to turn my plow. They will be sent there with the anointing prophesied some of them are going to be rich because you know if we think if people like blessing a congregation they can't have the devil in them if they're the richest people there some of them are going to be answers to problems they're going to be the one you've been praying for they're going to be there and they're going to, they're going to grow and serve and yes so nurse no sir till you tell them no <laughs> then that entitlement will come up but I but I but you know what I feel in here? That elder brother devil. I feel that spirit that was in the elder brother when the prodigal came home. Oh, you're going to reward them. You're going to bless them. And I've been here and I've been faithful in the name of Jesus. Let that spirit of religious entitlement. Oh, I feel welfare. Let that spirit of religious entitlement. together. Let it grow together. My church, my leaders come and say, hey, I, I, this singer is getting on my nerves. Okay, she's controlling, manipulative. She can barely sing. You know what I do? I said, what are you going to do about it? I don't know. That's why I was just coming to you. I'm like, no, that's not my problem. I don't oversee praise and worship. Sorry, I'm the senior pastor. <laughs> when my prophets come to me, squinting and shaking with their prophetess dust on their face. I saw a, a, a dragon at the back of the church behind the usher. And when the usher walked, it whapped a wing. And the Lord said, if you don't put her out, she's going to split the church. And I said, uh-huh. What are you going to do about it? Well, I'm coming to deliver the word of the Lord. It's off my hands. No, fool, that's not how that works. See, God didn't reveal that to me. He revealed that to you. And what that means is that where there is revelation, there is responsibility. If he revealed the problem, he don't give you the solution. I got enough work already. You do it. Y'all don't like that gospel. You do it. So my church, we don't have troublesome prophetic people. Every time somebody comes to me with a burden, I'm like, well, I hope to figure it out very soon. Let me know what you're going to do. Because you're not, your, your crisis is not my emergency. Your problem is not my priority. I want you to figure out what to do, what God revealed to you, so I can nurture this wheat over here. Let them grow together. I'm, I'm going to give you a word that you don't like, and I'm almost done, but you need problems. They make you better leaders. You need problems. Who am I talking to? They make you more intelligent. You need problems. They teach you faith. You need problems. They teach you what your buttons are. Sometimes God will allow you to have problems until you realize what's in you. Some of you in success and in moments of prosperity, you don't know that you still got an I quit or I won't or I can't down in you. But if you allow a problem to last, then you'll find yourself saying stuff that you never thought you were going to say. You would think that your victories were done, that you were past that moment, but God will allow a problem to confront the residue of the old you. The wheat and the tear must grow together. I cannot just advance you and protect you from adversity. I want you to have both so I can have a full-blown manifestation of my promise in the earth. 
No. Don't turn and give your attention and give your energy and give your prayer time and give your fasting to the tear. Let it grow together. The reason I want you to let it grow together, the parable says, is because if you go fighting and whacking and pulling the tear up, on accident, you may pluck the wheat. If you go into attack mode and start focusing your energy on everything wrong, you may miss something that I've been growing right. It is our tendency, particularly if you've been hurt and, or if you are a negative person, it is our tendency to think that the problems need more attention than the progress. But when you find yourself surfacing in problems, what you need to do is start searching for where the progress is. And if you allow both of them to grow together, oh, I want, now this is my word for this season. If you allow both of them to grow together and you have your table manners, you maintain your posture, you allow yourself to be consistent and remain unwavering in your faith towards God, then guess what's going to happen? Hard this time is going to come. Now, let's activate. I need you to help me. I want you to tell the person on your row uh, with the loudest color on, harvest time is about to come. Come on, tell them. Come on, prophesy. Harvest time. Let that out in the atmosphere. Open your mouth. Let that out. It's harvest. Come on, let it out. Say it. It's harvest time. Point your finger in somebody's face. It's harvest time. It's hard. Come on, tell somebody. Come on, get up and find somebody else to tell. Go. of harvest time is not to gather the wheat. When harvest time comes, your help comes for the tear. See, the first sign of harvest is not receiving what you've been growing. It's God dealing with what's been after you. That's how you know you're in harvest. Because all of a sudden, things that were growing and gaining strength against you begin to get more weak and weak and weak and weak. You start to find that you are stronger than the strong man now. And God is breaking and weakening. How many of you know your praise and worship has been applying pressure to things that have been after you and things that have been trying to distract you and things that have been coming to you? In harvest time, there is recompense. In harvest time, there is justice. In harvest time, there is judgment. In harvest time, there is fairness. In harvest time, there is the favor of God. It is harvest time in this house. Here is the warning. The warning is this, if you don't wake up, all of this will happen and you won't notice it. Seed will come, tear will come, wheat will come, and you will be snoring, relaxed, looking for solace, calling the hogs home. Well, what does that look like? Very easily. When you notice that the harvest is growing, that wheat is growing, it is the worst mistake of your life to maintain your posture. 
Did you hear what I said? If you are at the next level of harvest, you should not be at the last level of prayer. I'm glad I got my amens out the way because they're about to leave now. If you notice that your advancement is started to come, you cannot be at the last season's level of worship. If you look at David, he graduated in praise. He was at the peak of promotion by the time he danced out his clothes. That was outside of his personality. Remember, before he was just singing, and it went from singing to writing more music, and it went from singing to music to creating instruments. But finally, when he was about to be succeeded on that throne, he started doing things he had never done before. Many of you are missing progress because you're too lazy to shift your position. You ain't ran around the church in years. You ain't fasted in years. I can tell you about how big you got. You ain't been to prayer in years. Come on, church. You've not done anything different. And it's not that you're doing the wrong thing. You're just doing the same thing. When progress comes, you must change your position. Oh, I got to prophesy now. Some of you need to resign from positions you've been in. For over 10 years, you've been the main Now, many of you don't want to hear that because you, when you don't have an identity, positions mean anything for you. When you don't know your purpose, you want a position because position gives you purpose. You have no idea of what it means. But how many of you understand if you don't have a successor, you are not successful? you got to know what it is to move. Oh, it's quiet today. I hit something. you got to know when it is for you to be anointed to do something else. Some of you, at my church, a sure way to get fired is to be real good. I don't always fire people because they're bad. I fire them because they got too good. And if you get too good, oh, I'm talking to something. I hear this. If you get too good, you stagnate because you stop doing what some of you do your job so well that you need to find something else that's more complicated to keep you growing. And it's better to leave prematurely than it is to overstay your time. Because if you stay longer than you need to in a position, everybody under you must suffer because you have not evolved. Now I know why you quiet and you're sitting there like you're having a vision asking God to get me up out of here because we are religious and we're bound to positions. Mine, 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 mine. But I dare you to sow some of that before the Lord. I'm going to give this to you and see what else you're going to do with my life. I'm going to turn this over to you and see how else you're going to grow me and how else you're going to stretch me. How many of you know when houses stagnate, it's because they don't rotate enough. Many of you need to repent for idolatry of position. I'm talking to you. You need to repent, give it up. This is my seat and my place and my team. And I'm the chief that and I'm the lead that. Ma'am, if you don't go and be great in another way, you're going to hold all of us back. Years ago, I had a, a, a wicked dream. And in the dream, I saw many pioneers in the body of Christ dying in a relay race with their baton in their hand. Because we don't understand that God never wanted us to die in a position. I know what I'm talking about. Some of you need to relinquish it and change your position. You've got to become more passionate when you notice progress. You've got to, listen, if you are under attack, I don't understand why you're still late to church. If you are under attack, I would get perfect attendance for the whole month. Why? I am dedicated to changing my position. If it is my norm to be fashionably late, I'm going to be fashionably on time. You couldn't be under attack. You're too relaxed. You couldn't be aggressive, uh, progressing. You're under attack. When you are progressing or under attack, you must do more than what you've been used to doing. I'm believing God for favor. No, you're not. Because you're still worrying about the little measly 
we got to prove to you through the Mosaic law and the old covenant, and we got to go all the way back to prove you that God is worthy of a trifling 10%. You couldn't want favor. You will always have just enough because you don't give more than enough. You're not tithing at the level of your desire. You're tithing on your past. If I've got to wrestle with you for a dime, then my bare minimum is to make sure that all you got is chicken. You will never have abundance if you don't understand sacrifice. You will never have the overflow if you believe I'm El Chipo and not El Shaddai. You must be willing to release what's in your hand so he can release what's in his. So you have to do more. It's a sin to maintain your position when the season has changed. That's the warning of not being an awakened people. The Bible warns us be sober. Vigilant, it means to be awake for your adversary is walking around looking for someone to devour. And you know who the easiest prey is? Those that are asleep. So when you're under attack, you must do more than what you've been doing. And what it'll do is it'll change your perspective. You start to see, oh, wait a minute, maybe this is why this is going wrong. There has been a harvest. The Spirit of God wanted me to declare this so strong tonight. The wheat and the tear are growing together. Your problems and your progress, your advancement and your attack, they will get stronger. But don't you neglect your advancement and don't you ignore your progress to study a problem, to water an attack, if you are under attack, I would put the progress in your mouth. I wouldn't call my girlfriends, my friends to talk about the problem. I would get it out of my system. You know what? I, I heard Stephen Furtick say this, and it blessed me. He said, you know, I get so much backlash and so much criticism on the Internet. You know what I do to keep my heart healthy? I reply to all of them, and then I erase it. He said, he said I, I, I insult everybody that insults me. Yeah, your mama, your bald head thing, and then I just go ahead. I said, that is a great strategy where me and Furtick differ is I press enter and let it go viral. But I took some wisdom. Let me just get it out of my system and then move on with my day. Come on, tell somebody, keep it moving, keep it moving, keep it moving. The weed and the tear are going together, but I'm telling you, it's harvest time. And I prophesy to every one of you that have been in a tug of war. It has seemed as if you have taken three steps forward and 12 steps back. It has seemed as if after every major breakthrough and every major advancement that there has been something to stagger you. I decree days of harvest over you. I decree days of harvest over your children. I decree days of harvest over your family. I decree days of harvest on your marriage. I decree days of har harvest in your money. I decree your companies are coming into harvest. You are fruitful in ideas. You are fruitful in creativity. You are are fruitful in courage and boldness. You are no longer on the sideline, but there is a new degree of initiative in you. I decree you are stepping out of your comfort zone, and you are coming off the yellow light, and you are moving in the green of God. You are moving at an accelerated pace, and your blessings and your, your house is being enriched in quality and in quantity. There is both quantitative and qualitative growth coming to every you. May it be written in heaven, uh, may it be observed in the earth, uh, and may it be recorded in hell uh, that you have stepped into uh, a time of prophetic harvest uh, and nothing can stop what is on the way. If you believe that, give God some crazy pra <laughs> praise. Him. Oh, come on, praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. harvest time. I said it's harvest time. Don't be distracted by the tear. 
The point of the tear is to make you appreciate the wheat. Part of what this is doing in you is making you a quality examiner. God is opening your eyes to recognize what is what. Lift your hands in the name of Jesus. Oh, I feel glory right there. In the name of Jesus, I activate the law of clarity in your life. That you will no longer treat advancement as if it is an attack. And you will no longer treat an attack as if it deserves your attention. But I activate the law of clarity over you and I command your eyes open. I command your ears to be circumcised. I command the scales to fall off of you. And I release the anointing of deciphering, of detection, of discernment upon you that you would know which way to go. I decree over you that you are moving into dangerous decision making. And that God is not just anointing your discernment. He's anointing your decision making skills. That the doors that are opening in your life are going to be opened by the power of a great decision. Decisions in your business, decisions in your staff, decisions in your money. Let there be a strong anointing for quality decisions. And I release to you right now the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you will make decisions that you don't regret. That you will make decisions that open up prosperity. That you will make decisions that change history and open up keys to harvest. I release that to you in the name of Jesus. Now just worship him a minute, will you? Come on, worship. Oh, come on, change your position and worship. Let awakening happen. Let awakening happen. Awaken us. Come on, worship. Awaken us. Awaken us. Awaken us. Sin awakening to America. Sin awakening to Georgia. Sin awakening. Come on, awaken, awaken. I will change my position. I will not remain as I was, how I was. I will not continue in my routine. Come on. We abandon our routine. We abandon our, our regularity. We abandon our routine. And we embrace revelation. We embrace new wisdom. We embrace new insight. And we will change our position. We will change our position. Just lift your hands and worship him through there. I feel the spirit of wisdom manifesting in this building. I feel the spirit of wisdom come on as he plays. Glory is moving. Wisdom. Come on, lift your voice to him. Change your position. Change your position. Change your position. Come on, worship him. Come on, worship him. Oh, come on a little more. Come on, worship. I will change my position. I will change my position. Listen. I want you to think about something God has been challenging you on. How many of you have been in a season where it seems like of necessity Almost like a turning point has come and the Spirit of God has been prompting you to do opposite of what you would normally do. How many of you feel like you have entered into an ultimatum of sorts? This is that season in your life and God is demanding that his people change position because something is about to be born in the earth. 
would you believe me and I'm not discrediting it I'm not making light of it these storms I believe have come as a satanic distraction and the reason I say that is because God has arrested his church in a very profound way and something is about to be born in America. You must change your news sources in this hour. And you're not going to be able to be as prophetic as you need to be with your face on the TV. And, and using the news to give you your updates. There are fresh updates coming out of heaven right now. And if you're going to change your position, you must stay in tune with what's going on in the press releases of the spirit, the broadcasts of heaven. If you do that, you'll have faith for what's to come. Change your position. Uh, I believe for every mother, every father, change your position. Every leader, change your position and there will be harvest. For every tear you've cried, for every seed you've sown, for every moment you spent in uncertainty, I declare harvest has come to your life. If you believe that, take your about 10 seconds and rejoice to the God of the harvest. symptom. Raise your hand. If you're dealing with a cancerous symptom, a lump, a growth, the doctors have tried to declare cancer over you. Let's do this real quickly. If you are around those people with their hands lifted, make a quick circle. I believe the Spirit of God just whispered to me, he's about to heal cancer. Oh, you don't suck. Come on. I know you're tired and it's late, but we are a revival people, aren't we? Let's do this. time for you to finish your course. You have begun to prepare for the words. There are two of you who this is in your, your uterus. I, I see a uterus. God is healing you even now. Come on, begin to declare miracles. It's harvest time. You will not leave the earth before you have seen harvest. Come on, pray for them. Come on, pray for them right now.
the river's moving. Don't miss this moment. Come on, the river's moving. Don't miss this moment. Change your position. This is the word of the Lord. Don't miss this moment. Don't miss this moment. Don't miss this moment. Don't miss this moment. Many of you, God is talking to you right now about how to change your position. You must do what you've not done before. You must say what you've not said before. You must act how you've not acted before. Let's just work this river for a minute. I'm looking at a lot of wives who are crying themselves to sleep every night. It's, it's a spirit of depression, a spirit of heaviness. And one of you, it's abnormal grief over a death. The river is moving right now. You know, the spirit is on you to prevent you from changing your position. There's, and you know what else? I sense very profound divorce that's got you arrested where you've not been able to change your position. whether or not you should tell anybody but I'm looking at like chemical levels of depression it has stopped you so much so where you can't even get out of the bed thank you father I see there's a woman who was let go recently from corporate America from a job you worked very long and it's got you so bitter that you can't change your position. You feel pressure to do more. You feel a lot of conviction to do more, but you can't. If you are up here, now listen, have the fear of the Lord. Don't just come up here because you want prayer. If you come up here because your back is hurting, I'm going to rebuke you. We're dealing with depression. I don't know why the Lord has taken me this way, but he has taken me this way. Come up here. That's you. Move now. Move now. Move now and move quickly. If you're in a therapist or if you're going to, if you've gone to see a therapist or not, come now. Now humble yourself. Healing is for the humble. You can't be free and worry about your dignity. I don't care what position you serve in, how people know you. You've been dealing with depression, and there's a man in here. You've gone back to alcoholism because of your depression. Come now. Come now. Come now. Come now. There's a very powerful anointing that's hitting here. This is your day. This is your day. One of you young women have a mom whose name is Liz. She's verbally abusive. You come up here too. Come now. Come now. Thank you, Lord. We give you honor. We give you praise. We give you honor and 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 praise. You are a man whose 
baby's mama is fighting you, threatening, threatening you with your children not to see them, and it's brought you into a place of depression, come now. Come now. Glory to God's name. God's going to set you free. God's going to set you free. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We're going to deal with this spirit of heaviness because it's preventing you from changing your position. Praise the wonderful name of Jesus.
medically you are healed, mentally you are healed, and God says he's going to, Satan has released a powerful hurricane in your family and God is stealing that right now. Allow yourself to be healed right now. Pastor Sam and whoever is authorized to help pray, I want them to just come and stand with me. Prophet Catherine, if you can. Jason, stay with me. We're going to lay hands on you. Lift your hands. In the name of Jesus, we release the fire of God. Will you come, Apostle? We release the fire of God. And right now, as we transfer the energy of God, the fire of the Holy Spirit, I command impact. May the power of God hit them, transform their lives, and do a thing in their body such as they have never seen. You spirit of depression, you spirit of heaviness, we command you as soon as we lay hands, you will leave these people, you will not torment them, you will not tear them, you will not rip them, but you will leave them in an instant in Jesus' name. Now come on, lift the music up. If you're out there, begin to pray for us. Come on. In the name, come on, you can go. In Jesus' name. Receive in Jesus' name. You ready? Receive. 
Thank you for the release. Thank you for the victory. Thank you for the victory. Thank you for the victory. It's harvest time. We give you honor and we give you the praise. Come on, put those hands together for Jesus all over this building. Hallelujah. I said, I'm believing God for complete turnarounds for you. How many of you receive that? If you go home to a problem, your bigger homework is find what's progressed. Because something has changed, even though you don't realize it. Say, I receive the word of the Lord. Is the name of our God. We're going to sow and we're going home. I want you to change your position. I want you to sow something you have not sold all week. And I want you to give tonight at a level that you've not given all week. It's a change of your position. I want them to come. I don't know where the envelopes are, if they are, if they are in the seat. If you look in the seat pocket before you, you're going to find an envelope. You're going to find an envelope and I want you to sow something that represents the change of your position something that's different from what you've sown before it's a change of position and we're just going to believe in faith that as you do this you are in a season of position changes how many of you know the Lord is more committed to your growth than he is your comfort And he'll touch a thing in your comfort zone to make sure you can change your position. That's the season you are in. Hallelujah. He's doing a thing to your comfort zone. And we're going to sow tonight. We're going to sow. How many of you were blessed by that word? How many of you were challenged by that word? Do not focus on the tear. Let it grow. Because it means that the wheat has gotten stronger. Praise the name of the Lord. I want you to go ahead and I want you to, they have giving options. If they do, put them on the screens. If you have more than one way to give, I don't want anybody to not give tonight. Put something in your hand. Thank you, Father. Family sold together business partner sold together respond to the word and change your position hallelujah give you some time there giving options here you can give I want every one of you to make sure even if you have children in this room make sure that they have the opportunity to give as well I want you to teach them now how to advance in that way to God, a change of position, a change of position, hallelujah, you need to do more of what you haven't done, don't sleep, but awake, awake, This guy, you got on a gold chain with a white shirt. Who is your mom alive? Your mom here? Come here. Is she? Where's your mom? Let me pray for you. Stand there. Come here. I want to pray for you, and I want to pray for your mom. Father, I'm asking that the strain and the provisional stress right now, the tension of this moment, particularly this week, I'm asking 
that you would bring peace, that there would be no more contention and strife between the two of them, that there would be no more division or the taking of sides. Make provision. Switch that living situation and do it really quickly so that, you, that they will know you are God. And Lord, you know what he needs. There's a decision between going to one place and staying in another place whether or not a program is going to be sufficient, there's a rehabbed behavior necessary. And I'm asking that you would do it miraculously. And help them to know that the change you started to make in June, June, there were changes you started to make and God wants you to know they're real and he's going to help you with them. You tell your mama, God has not forgotten. Father, I loose grace for provision in the glorious name of Jesus. Come on, put those hands together for the Lord all over this building. Uh, I, I think this is a vest. You, all the way, at the, yeah, you, all the way, at the, come here. Hallelujah. I'm taking some time to make sure you get the right amount in your hand. When, me, when preachers call offerings, we reach for the wrinkle money first. Find something a little more sharper. Lift your hands, please. The level of pain you were in has been so much for you to stand under, think under, move under, and it's because of betrayal. The thing you had feared the most had started to happen. And what I hear God saying is I'm gathering your emotions and I'm doing it without your effort. You have been feeling like, God, I don't know what to do. And the Lord says, I don't want you to do anything but receive. And I'm going to heal you. And this story will not be one that shames you, saith the Lord but it's going to promote you. For you have put yourself in a position where you have needed God's grace and you have needed to see that you are much harder on yourself than God would ever be. And God says, because of this, not only will I give you a new start and not only will I give you a new beginning, but I'll stop the mouths of those that have tried to crush your confidence. Yes, one, two, and three. And I'll give you the ability, God says, to be self-sustained and to not borrow and to not be at the mercy of anybody who gives to you with hidden agenda. Provision is coming to you and a new job is on its way. I loose that to you in the name of Jesus. Come on, give God praise all over this building. Hallelujah to the Son of God. Hallelujah to the Son of God. Tell the person next to you, get the right offering. You are to remain planted. I'm going to move your head. Just let me put my hand. You are one of those that Satan has started to grow tear around you. And every day it's a tug of war about whether or not you're going to remain focused or be distracted. And because of this, there's some things that you've missed out on. But God's about to refocus you. And I'm telling you, it won't be seven days before you find your peace of mind back to you. And the heart that's been crying out from you about coming out of a time of loss, God wants you to know that you can't lose anything that he doesn't have in abundance. Lift your hands. God's healing your trust, lady. Your problem is, is that you have trust issues, but you don't realize how it's affected your faith. Your faith has been under assault, and God is healing your heart right now. It has been traumatic, but the Spirit of God is going to address it, and it's going to give you the grace to believe Him, because in January, the greatest opportunity of your life is going to open up. He wants to heal you now so that you're ready for what is to come. Father, mend this heart. Help her to stay planted so that she bears fruit. In the glorious name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. How many of you ready to give on this word? Come on, how many of you ready to give on this word? Hallelujah. Come here. Because of the change you've made and 
because of the two temptations that came upon you and you won with flying colors. God's going to break the curse of rent off of you. You are about to come into ownership very quickly and it's going to be miraculous how the Lord sets you up to no longer be a borrower. There will be ownership that comes to you because your brokenness has not embarrassed you. And instead of running from God like you did last June, you ran to him. He's gathering you with great mercy and he's restoring you. Now lift your hands almost like the, the father heart of God is coming to undo what was done to you because you felt like you needed that time to sit on a dad's lap and cry. That thing has happened in you and torn you and made you very self-conscious. But today, God's healing the boy in you so that the man can live. Not only will you prosper, you're going to prosper and create ways for others to do the same. Welcome to harvest time. Come on, put those hands together for the Lord. Oh, come on, put those hands together for Jesus. Hallelujah. I can't see you with this. Is this? Let me tell you how much I can't see. Is that a Jordan sign on your shirt? No, not you. This one here. Come here. I was close. <laughs> and it's going to be harvest time. Is this your wife? Please stand up. Father, let the real estate angels do war for this. I see a war over some property. I see some theft and I see some, some criminal dishonesty. Today as I stand before you as a prophet of God, the gavel comes down and the red tape is cut. And God says, not only will you get your property, there will be a surprise one that comes right along with it. The wheat and the tear have grown together, and you have passed this test with great, great, great victory. Hallelujah. Where Adidas man, come here. God has been dealing with you about stewardship. And he's been dealing with you about not being sloppy with the little that you have. And it's been frustrating because you feel the tug and the pull toward advancement and the tug and the pull to do more, but you've only had a little. And God says to tell you, you're graduating now because you've done what I wanted you to do with the little that you have. But the Lord says there is a thing. You have been uh, one of those that have wanted to be good and better and best because of who was not good to you. You said, I'm going to be the type of dad and the type of husband and the type of man I didn't have. And the Lord says, I don't want you being good because of someone else's failure. I want you being good because I made you good. God is about to break the cords to your past to develop a strong tie to your future. You think that situation with that job was a miracle you think how i switched you around from that disaster in 2012 was a miracle you think that what i blocked from you in terms of quick death was a miracle you've not seen miracles yet the best and the strongest and the greatest is before you and like joseph i'm going to open up the opportunity for you to be the deliverer to your siblings i see it coming to you and oh come on give god praise right here Come here, yeah. Last one, and we give it. I know you you can't wait to give, can you? I know. Honor is yours. Come here, sir. 
you will be held accountable to God for what you do with your gifts. And you will answer to God about allowing yourself to remain uncultivated. Something is going on where there is a strong, you are a suppressed man. Gifts and hungers and abilities in you that you're not responding to for fear and for judgment. But God is going to take rest from you until you answer, yeah. He's mandated your obedience and God gave you a bottom line in about April. And uh, what's happening is I see a war of two crowds. One is saying, come this way. The other one is saying, come that way. And when you wanted to move and act in faith, you thought it was premature. In fact, I see a voice coming to you saying, no, don't do that. But God's about to surround you with the counsel of heaven toward your deliverance and your destiny. Sir, you are about to be visited to God. When you've been given a talent and a gifting from God and you don't do what you need to do to cultivate it and let it breathe, you are judged and you are measured accordingly and you have been ignoring a hunger for the sake of family agreement. And God says to tell you right now what I'm about to do with you is about to challenge you to do some things that people don't agree with. And if you will obey me now, in a season, I'll make them see what I've been doing. But I have hidden it from them to break the fear of man off of you. Follow me, son. Follow me. And God will transform your life. Father, break the, oh, that's, that is so. Break the torment off of this one. And give them the courage to follow you. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Come on, celebrate the king in this place. How many of you are ready to give? How many of you are ready to give? <laughs> it's harvest time. Lift those seeds all the way to the Lord, will you? And wave it in the devil's face, will you? Come on, that's what they would do in harvest time. Wave it in the devil's face. In the name of Jesus, we decree that as we come into agreement with this word, and as we come into agreement with this season, that these seeds are on assignment and that you are moving towards the future and right now in the name of Jesus as an act of our will we step out of the past and we step into the future and we come into agreement with the harvest in Jesus name come on if you believe that lift up a robust shout to the king in what God is doing now.
Lord. Well, this has been a great conference, hasn't it? How many of you have just received something from the Lord that is going to be a part of your legacy that he's going to use you to release to generations? Amen? I believe it. Do you? Say, I receive it. In Jesus' name. Well, just a few announcements as we get ready to depart tonight. Please remember that the 8030 Gala is tomorrow night. Yes, it's going to be awesome. Come with bells, whatever else the Lord shows you to show out because we're going to dress up and, and just have an incredible time. Our acknowledgers tomorrow night, of course, Apostle John Eckhart. Uh, yes, it's going to be awesome. And um, Bishop Hammond and, and others will be speaking. Um, I want to tell you that Apostle John Eckhart will be speaking here Sunday morning at our 1030 service. So if you do not have a church uh, home where you need to be and you want to join us, we want to invite you to join us Sunday morning for Apostle John Eckhart. We are excited to have him. I want to tell you also that the speaker's table and the vendors will be open. TLC Live, can you believe it? It's finally our last night. We're kind of sad, but we're excited. The man of God, Dr. Matthew Stevenson, just, I mean, that was a powerful word that moved the people. We thank God for it. Now we have, I told you I was going to have him back here. We have Apostle Buddy Crum in the house. Amen. Thank God Amen. for Apostle Buddy Crum. Amen. Well, I certainly was blessed tonight with the Word of God, and I know you were, and it is a time to take that Word and keep it alive and let it grow and let it go. And I'm telling you, Dr. Stevenson brought a solid Word for us tonight, and it's exciting. Thank you so much. God the bless you. honor is all mine. Well, it was uh, wonderful for you to be here with us. The people were, they're not going to leave the scene. They, they, <laughs> they've grown up. As you kept telling me, it's time to grow up, and, and we've grown up a little bit. So it's so good to have you. And I would just want you to kind of give us a little bit of the word that, uh, not the word <laughs> that you gave us tonight, sure. Sure. but you know what I mean. Uh, just allow us to hear a little bit what's on your heart. Sure. Well, we're in a very sensitive time, uh, not just in America, but in the body of Christ. And I really feel like it is a time for us to be more focused than we have ever been before. You know, part of what we dealt with tonight was how the wheat and the tear grow together, but our tendency to focus on the tear uh, leaves room for us to neglect the cultivation of the wheat. So I really believe in America and the kingdom, it is harvest time, but there's a need to really focus on what God has been growing instead of what Satan has been doing to stop it. I, I really feel that, and I'm excited about the awakening that's happening right now before our eyes, you know, in times of moral decay and political political corruption and when racial tensions are high and financial calamities occur, I think that it is an opportune moment for those that have been being cultivated, even in the cave of Abdullah, to come and manifest God's glory, his splendor, his brightness, his majesty. I'm so excited about the coming day. So my admonishment to you is don't be distracted. There are attacks, there are antagonists, and there is adversity. But what God is doing is far more superior, far more greater, far more worthy of our attention and our effort than what hell is trying to do to stop them. Wow, amen, thank God. Listen, we asked our viewers if they had questions to send them in. So we had two that uh -oh. I told them I would, I would definitely put before you. Okay. And so Edith, Edith out of Little Rock had okay. a question uh, based on the word you were teaching. Sure. She said that she felt like her position would change sure. for about two years, sure. and then somehow she would end back up in the same place. Sure. Then it would change again, and she would end back up. It's like a cycle in sure. her life. So how does she end that cycle? Sure. 
Well, wisdom breaks every cycle. You know, the Bible talks about how wisdom is the principal thing. But in cycles, uh, when they peak, sometimes you grow into wisdom deficiency, which is why the Bible tells us if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. When things stop moving, we need to get the why of God. And sometimes, especially when there are cycles of things that are close to us, we panic. And what the devil does is in a cycle, he, he dullens our hearing. So I would admonish you, seek the wisdom of God. And I'm not talking about good advice and sound counsel. I'm talking about the explanation to what you're facing. What I know about God is he will allow a thing to remain as it is, to heighten our desire for the answer. And so my prayer for you is that your craving for the answer of God concerning how to end the cycle would be the thing that keeps your position mm. ever moving. You cannot yeah. evolve without coming to the peak of a thing. And when you come into the peak of a thing, you'll start off at the bottom of another thing. Life moves in levels, destiny moves in levels. Everything that God wants for you will manifest in phases. So what you think is a cycle may be a phase. You need the wisdom to know the difference between the two. Praise God. Amen. Yeah. All right. You know, I have to get Larry's question in. Larry is in Canada. Okay. So he wants to know, uh, first he said you gave him a great piece when sure. you talked about not moving so fast, sure. just allowing the wheat and tares to grow. Sure. He said, but when does, he, when will he know to move away from the tears. Sure. Well, when it's harvest time, God deals with the tears. In, a, in our parable, the Bible says that as you allow the wheat and the tear to grow together, when harvest time comes, the best warfare weapon you need to do is to watch God do the war. You know, sometimes there is a, uh, I believe, a culturally induced battle paranoia where we don't feel like we're receiving if we're not fighting and, and that if we're not doing our part if we're waiting on God to be the one that fights for us. But he told the Israelis in the book of Exodus, the children of Israel in the book of Exodus, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. I believe that stillness is the best posture for being a recipient. And it doesn't mean doing nothing. It means allowing your trust in God to grow until he has done what he, what the word says he would do which was burn the tear in front hey. of your face. You will see mm -hmm. as God does the burning of the tear. Now, how do you know he's doing it? Because you see it. God does not defeat your enemy mm. in private. He will do that thing publicly. It doesn't matter what it is. As you begin to notice your enemies decrease before you, you will know it's God bringing your harvest closer to you. There's a time for increased enemies. I believe that one of the signs you know that you've increased in favor is an increased number of enemies. David said, many are they that rise against me. So there's a time for increased number of enemies, but there's also a time for a decreased number of enemies. In harvest, there is a decreased number of enemies. In promotion, it starts to increase. You just know, need to distinguish what phase you're at. Wow, thank you so much. My honor, my honor. Amen. Amen. I, I'm thinking about, again, where in Hebrews it says, enter into that rest. Yes, sir. It Amen. doesn't mean that you stop, right. but it does mean you allow to, the as you've been teaching, the work of the Lord to yes, do sir. his work. Amen. And you are at a rest to let it happen. Absolutely. Beautiful Amen. words you brought Absolutely. us tonight. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Amen. It's a wonderful way to Amen. end our legacy conference with the man of God. And you're here almost every year. So <laughs> everybody gets excited about the final night. Yes. They know you're going to yeah. be here. Oh, wow. So we're so thankful to have you. And I know you're a son yeah. of this vision. Amen. Uh, and have a great relationship with Dr. Mary as yeah. she's visiting you yeah. so often. Yeah. So we're just happy to have you. Yeah. And Pastor Buddy, did you want to pray us out tonight? Of course, I will. Father, we thank you for the word, the seed harvest that is in process mm -hmm. even right now. Lord, we're in a transitional time. I heard the word tonight that you said, I will not be denied. Yes, I Lord. will be seen. I will be recognized. And Lord, we take that as an, as an assurance to know that you have allowed those things to come to pass that we might be strengthened to be overcomers when they come again. Yes, so we Lord. thank you tonight for the word. It shall not return void. It shall prosper whereto you've sent it and shall bring forth the harvest. We again thank you for your presence. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading us into truth tonight. And we say that with a grateful heart in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. We bless you, amen. each of you, as you've been blessed tonight by the prophet, Dr. Stevenson. Remain blessed. God bless.